Okay, we're still looking at uh, the rise of Honest Abe, the President of the United States. We're not there yet. <clears throat> uh, a woman Lincoln had been engaged to died unexpectedly, plunging him into grief so deep that he was, um, said later he was suicidal. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't carry it out. Uh, Lincoln did eventually marry the daughter of a very wealthy and prominent family in Kentucky. And this is, uh, um, Lincoln was marrying far above his station. As they used to say, Lincoln was a genuine certified born in a log cabin poor boy who was <clears throat> so gifted he rose to be a millennium class leader. <clears throat> the woman he married was Mary Todd <clears throat> from a slave owning family in Kentucky. And, um, they were engaged for a while, broke off the engagement, renewed the engagement, and eventually married. Ironically, Mary Todd was also courted by Stephen Douglas. Lincoln and Douglas knew each other. They'd been in the legislature for a long time. Uh, they weren't on the same page. They would eventually have these very famous debates I'm not yet up to. But uh, so Lincoln marries Mary Todd. Mary Todd proved to be what you might call high maintenance. Okay. Uh, it's conceivable that being married to Mary Todd taught Lincoln the patience and forbearance he would require in leading the nation through its greatest crisis. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Mary Todd's whole family supported the Confederacy during the war. Lincoln had a number of brothers-in-law who all all fought for the South, although the state of Kentucky remained in the Union. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, had four sons. The first one, Robert Todd Lincoln, uh, was in Harvard at the time of the Civil War. Uh, over his father's objections, he, he wore the uniform before the war was over. His father saw to it that he was in a safe assignment as a staff officer. The Lincolns had had quite enough of grief. Their second son died as a small child. Their third and fourth sons were <coughs> small children at the time they moved to the White House, and one of them, one of them came down with some kind of illness that could easily be treated today and died. And inconveniently, while a major social event was going on downstairs in the White House, Lincoln is making all these little trips upstairs to check on his son who did not survive. Mary Todd was plunged into deep grief and she was having seances in the White House trying to make contact with their lost son. Okay. It's called spiritism, I think. It was uh, popular at the time. Uh, the remaining younger son survived his father but also died at the age of 18. Robert Todd went on to uh, great success, considering himself to be far more of his mother's social rank than his father's, although it didn't hurt being Abraham Lincoln's son. Robert Todd Lincoln went on to be the uh, U.S. ambassador to Great Britain and lived until the year 1927. Okay. Lincoln, disappointed with, with politics, left politics after his one term in Congress, did not return for several years, but when Lincoln was 45 years old in 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act pulled some kind of trigger and Abraham Lincoln, he became active again, going out making speeches opposing the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He joined the new Republican Party. He called enough attention to himself that the first ever Republican Party National Convention, uh, his name was put in nomination for vice president and he got 110 votes. He didn't get the nomination, of the party, but they considered him. Two years later in 1858, the Illinois Republicans put him up against Senator Stephen Douglas. Um, the senatorial elections were not like they are now. That was still in the time when, as provided in the original Constitution, the state legislatures chose the senators because they represented the states as equal political entities. They were not popularly elected until the early 20th century. That came about as a result of the, third, of the uh, 16th Amendment uh, ratified in 1913. Okay, so 
The chance that the Illinois legislature would replace Stephen Douglas, who was emerging as the most powerful of all members of the Senate, with, with the Republicans, kind of a long shot. But uh, Lincoln challenged Douglas to a series of debates. And Douglas accepted, thinking he probably had nothing to lose. Uh, Douglas was known as the Little Giant. He was a man of very short stature, wide girth, almost as big around as he was tall. Not really, that's an overstatement, but it must have been odd seeing him side by side. What's Douglas, five foot six, something like that? Lincoln, six feet four. They did know each other. And they debated each other, uh, the debates lasting, I don't know, I think in an hour and a half, but I could be confused with modern debates. Uh, and I think seven different locations in Illinois, and this drew enormous national attention, and verbatim transcripts of the debates ran in newspapers all over the country, including the South. So this is what propelled Lincoln into the spotlight as a national figure. Now, Douglas thought he had nothing to fear because he was fully equipped. He had the politician's uh, smoothness. He knew how to say nothing and make it sound profound, all of that. Well, Lincoln is still something of a rough out redneck, kind of a country boy. Douglas didn't, didn't have to do Lincoln well, but he may not have known what he was dealing with. What Lincoln ended up doing to Douglas, mainly at the debate at Freeport, Illinois, was to, to make him answer a question directly. Douglas had been skirting this the whole time because he wanted to be president. And again, as I've told you before, this is the curveball that's going to kill you. The recent, this is in 1858, the previous year, the Dred Scott decision in the Supreme Court had stripped away any power the federal government might have had in determining the status of slavery in newly organized territories. So what Lincoln, who was always anti-slavery, don't let anybody tell you any different, he came from a came from a, uh, an anti-slavery family, and he never wavered from this. But he's a lawyer, he's practical, he knows that the way you get it done might not please everybody. All right. How can a slavery block, how can a slavery, let me reword that. How can a territory prevent slavery or keep slavery out? How can they do that? Lincoln finally cornered Douglas, and Lincoln knew more than a few courtroom tricks. He was a very good lawyer. Uh, and Douglas's reply was that all a territorial legislature would have to do to keep slavery out is not pass any laws protecting the institution of slavery. That ought to do it. This came to be called the Freeport Doctrine and it ended up disqualifying Douglas for the presidency because this made him a completely dead issue in the South. The Southerners are not going to support Stephen Douglas. And they didn't, as we saw when we got to the election of 1860. Um, uh, the Southerners walked out. They were not going to have Douglas. They nominated John C. Breckinridge instead. The Northerners nominated Stephen Douglas, and Douglas did something that was not you're supposed to do in those days. He went out campaigning actively, but not in the North. He campaigned in the South. He knew he wasn't going to win. What he was doing was not saying, vote for me. He was begging, pleading the Southerners to stay in the Union, even if and when Lincoln won. He's trying to clean up a mess that he himself had more to do with making than anybody else. His efforts were too little and too late. By the way, these debates are known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the one in 1858, the one's in 1858, and they're a UIL contest. Well, it's a very sort of freestyle debate where the debaters are supposed to uh, play off each other in a more uh, informal way than formal debate. Okay, they used to make me judge that. Didn't have that good a clue what I was doing. Okay, comes the election of 1860, Early in that year, some New York Republicans invited Lincoln to make a speech at a gathering at a building that still stands in New York City called the Cooper Union. And we have, we have a written account of that from a man who was there. By the way, Lincoln later at least told one of his secretaries he thought writing was the greatest invention of mankind. 
because you could send communications directly from the future. You could receive communications directly from the past. That's what we have here. This man, you know, says that Lincoln is, his suit is rumpled, his hair is unkempt, he's unbelievably tall and ungainly and his sleeves are too short. And he starts out in his sort of high-pitched, borderline irritating voice and he has country pronunciations, Mr. Chairman, uh, here for her and stuff like that. And then as Lincoln warmed to his topic in the longest speech of his we have on record, he just overwhelmed everybody. And they're all just on their feet cheering for him before it's over. And on leaving, somebody else came up to the, our reporter here and said, what do you think of, think of the rail splitter now? And the guy said, he's the greatest man since St. Paul. <laughs> that might be stretching it, but only a bit. Okay, as I told you, Lincoln swept the northern states and won with less than like 38% of the popular vote. Now, certain southern states led by South Carolina had openly vowed to withdraw from the Union if that baboon Lincoln, as they called him, won the election. And South Carolina made good on that on something like December 21st, 1860. After the election, a constituent assembly met in Charleston, South Carolina. Pardon me, not Charleston. It's not the capital. Columbia, South Carolina. And there they adopted articles of secession. I'll put the word up on the screen here. That is to withdraw from something. So South Carolina uh, claims that it has severed all relations with the United States and is no longer a state of the Union. By the time Lincoln was sworn in on March 1st, or 4th rather, having entered the city in disguise the night before, six other states had followed. And those were the Deep South states. You have uh, South Carolina, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Texas. Um, I'm not sure it included North Carolina. It did not include Virginia or Arkansas or Tennessee uh, or, or Kentucky or Missouri. Those were slave states. Okay. Um, the last of these pre-inauguration states was Texas, uh, which if you'd had a referendum in Texas, it would got a 50 some odd percent of the vote, wouldn't have made it to 60. Texas was divided on secession. And Sam Houston, the great Sam Houston, had only served one term as governor of Texas. He'd been a distinguished senator for quite a while after being president of the Republic. Um, and... Uh, he was removed from office for refusing to sign the Article of Secession. They removed him, put somebody else in. Okay, Houston did support the Confederacy once it was a done deal, died in 1863. Okay, now, as we'll see, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do the Civil War. I want you to read that chapter carefully. It's short. It flies over the war at a very high altitude, but, um, about six weeks after Lincoln was inaugurated, the first shots were fired by the state of South Carolina upon a federal garrison at Fort Sumter, a brick fortification built on a man-made island in the harbor of Charleston, whereupon Lincoln called upon the states to send up 75,000 volunteer troops, a clear signal that he intended to wage war on the seceding states who had formed a union of their own called the Confederate States of America, adopted a constitution, which is a verbatim copy of the U.S. Constitution with, with uh, protections for slavery written in. In fact, the leaders at that point were political leaders in the South who had fought against secession to the last fingernail, but they wanted to make sure the real crazies didn't take over, so they took the lead. Okay, so uh, four of the remaining eight states then seceded for a total of 11 states. Missouri and Kentucky stayed in the Union, although they were slave states and expressed official sympathy for the Confederacy. Maryland was held in the Union by the scruff of the neck by Lincoln. Delaware is not John Wayne in a barroom brawl. So with that, uh, the Union is temporarily broken up and the Civil War proceeded. I have, I'm gonna post a, a video and be patient because audio doesn't kick in for a while. It's not very good at all, but it's a thing I did in uh, winter of 2018. Abraham Lincoln, uh, Leadership and the Power of Language. Hope you can bull your way through that.